Alrighty, so in the past weeks, you know, we did a series on God's eternal purpose that unpackaged, you know, the reason why God created the earth in the first place and how we factor into that eternal purpose. Why we're, you know, obviously he created the earth, he created us. Yeah, for what? Uh, you know, that is the question on on everybody's mind, you know, humans. Uh, why are we here? Where did I come from? Am I significant? Does my life have any meaning? Is there a purpose for my life? I told you guys before, somebody sent me a link one time to a YouTube thing. This guy named John Lennox. He's a mathematics professor at Oxford University in England, older man. He was given a defense of why he was a Christian. Uh, and it was based on that very idea about the question that's on everyone's mind. Why am I here? Who am I? And does my life have any meaning, any purpose? People wonder about that. Philosophers have wondered about it forever. And still do, I guess. I don't remember what that guy said. But I know that in my personal study time, the next day or shortly thereafter, I was reading in the book of Ephesians, and I realized that the Apostle Paul, it just so happened, book of Ephesians, first chapter, he unpackaged all of that and answered every question. God has blessed his people, those whom he foreknew from before the foundation of the world, that they would be holy and without blame before him in love, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That's before the Garden of Eden. Well, that sounds pretty significant, chosen by God. Must have had a reason, purpose for that. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing, Paul said, in heavenly, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We talked about that. If you got physical blessings, if you have your health, if you got a decent job, your needs are met, got a good spouse, healthy kids, uh, whatever, you could go on down the line. Any one of those things would be a blessing. Physical blessing. Every, a spiritual blessing is worth a hundred, a thousand times more than a physical blessing. He says you got... You're blessed if you're in him. He, just as God, he, God, chose us, Paul said, speaking to the Christian, in him, in Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Holy, without blame, yeah, we're talking quality of life here. Quality of life predestined us to adoption, to adopt us as sons. Romans 8 says, right in his own household, co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ. You ever receive an inheritance? You know, if you get some, it, you know, you appreciate that. What do you suppose your inheritance is? Joint heirs with Christ <laughs> in the kingdom of God. Woo! That, that's a lot. Redeemed, redeem we have redemption, Paul said, through his blood, forgiveness of sins. Do you realize he had to kill his son in order to make you acceptable in him, in the beloved? Kill his own son in order to save you and I. I, I can't package it now, but you know this. Jesus was not a robot. Jesus is the architect of this thing. When Jesus put on this skin suit, you know, this Adam suit came down in the likeness of sinful flesh. He come parachuting down here, born as a baby in a manger. And he didn't leave here either until they crucified him. 33 years on this earth. He didn't go home on the weekend. He was here the whole time. That's a long time to be down here. I mean, hell, how long have some of us been here, right? A little more, even 33 years. Difficult place. If he would have yielded to that flesh of his, you know, the devil was after him, man, like a bug on a June, June duck on a June bug or whatever. 
It said he went after him, and then he threw everything at him because he thought, if this guy sins, I win. The trials against Christ were real. He was tempted in all points yet without sin. Man, it was, it was not easy. Do you realize that the risk then? God could have lost his son forever. Woo, we don't even think about that. Main known to us the mystery of his will. And then after we trusted in Christ, verse 12, that he sealed us. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you have believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of, the, of promise, who is the guarantee you're going to make it. If you want to. If you want to. God guarantees it. If you want to, you can walk away anytime you want. People do, too, by the way. They do. That's right. I told you I wasn't going to unpack that. So, I mean, if you really looked at that now and just, you know, that's not even one chapter in the New Testament book of the Bible. And he answered all those questions. <laughs> Can you see you're significant when you read that? Can you see you were born for a purpose? That our lives matter? All those things that he lists here. And I said, I just happened to come across that after hearing some guy give a, a defense of why he was a Christian because he said Christianity is the only belief system that answers that question fundamental to all human beings. He's right. Islam doesn't do that. Hindu, Buddhist, all that stuff does not answer those questions about who you are and why you're here and what your purpose and the significance of your life is. That's all kind of for free in a sense, but that's, we need to see this bigger picture because, man, it helps us overcome this crazy world. Because if all you see is this world, you're going to get flattened. It's too depressing. It's broke. And it, but it's the Bible that tells you the world is broke. Quit trying to fix it. God calls us out of the darkness, the Bible says, and into his marvelous light. And we are his workmanship. He's going to change you and me. He hasn't changed the world. The world was screwed up before, still screwed up. In Hebrews chapter 12, we'll get right into it here. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, obviously, 12 follows chapter 11. A lot of people refer to the Hebrews 11 as the great faith chapter. List all these people by faith, by faith, by faith. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Noah. By faith, uh, Moses. By faith, Sarah. Overcame many ways. Accomplished much. By faith, by faith. So, you slide right into that 12th chapter then. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore then, in light of all the things about those faithful of chapter 11, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance this race that is set before us. Now looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down now at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls, you have not yet resisted unto bloodshed, striving against sin. Notice that Jesus had a sinner problem. We have a sin problem. And then he said, now, God's going to work with you here. He, he, he's exhorting us, his sons. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. He scourges every son he receives. In other words, you're going to have some, you're going to, you're going to make some mistakes, he said. And God's going to give you a whooping because he loves you, not because he's trying to kill you. But he said we've had fathers, you know, that did their best. Some, anyway. Uh, I wouldn't put mine in that 
category, but indeed for a few days, verse 10 says, they chastened us what seemed best to them, but he, God, for our profit. Why does he do that? With that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening, no discipline seems to be joyful at the present, but it's painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It's training. The Bible says, train up the child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Therefore, he says, strengthen them hands that's hanging down. And them feeble knees, come on, get up, get up, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated or get worse, that your problems get worse. Get down out of them bushes up there in that rough and rocky road. Let's go, get down here and be healed. You see... God had a purpose for making all this and making us. Now, last week, what we unpackaged, that he very specifically was transforming his people into the very image, the character of his son. We looked at those scriptures that bear that out. In other words, God is not just tweaking some of our bad behavior. He's just not polishing off a few rough edges. What does it say God does with that old man? Kill it. Kill it. The old man, he said, is to be put to death. That what remains is no longer you who live, as Paul said. I am crucified with Christ, yet I live it in me. It's Christ who lives in me. Woo, that's radical. That's how far this goes. He's not trying to adjust your bad habits. He killing that old man, raising up something entirely different. A spiritual person, too, by the way. No longer considered, as Romans 8 says, in Romans 8, verse 8 and 9, you, those in the flesh, Paul said, can't please God. Ah, but you, Christian, you're not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwell in you. And he said, and if anyone don't have the Spirit of Christ, he ain't his. That ain't Steve speaking. That's what it says. So this transformation, as we will see, is not done by us. It's done by God. Well, what do you bring to this relationship after you've been so cruddy? Just a desire to be made whole. You can't change what happened. You didn't sign. You know, we already read those verses before. There's no indication you signed up for this. You just woke up one day and you were here. And I don't mean here in this building. I mean in life itself. Kids don't wonder where they came from. You start getting older and you go, hmm, how did I get here anyway? Mom, how did I get here? Go ask your dad. <laughs> <coughs> Easy. Easy. <coughs> he tells us what we've come to if you look in Hebrews chapter 12, continuing. <clears throat> One, he tells you what you didn't come to. Verse 18, you haven't come to the mountain that could be touched, that burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and voice of words that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. They couldn't even endure what was commanded. If even so much as the beast touched the mountain, it would be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. This is when God spoke to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Scared him half to death. They told Moses, look, Moses, you go up there and talk to him, figure out what he wants. You come back and tell us, we'll do it. Just don't let him talk to us anymore, lest we die. God said, this is a wise people. He said, I've done this to put the fear of me in them, that they might obey me. They might obey me. God wasn't being mean. I used to thunder from Sinai when my kids were little too, right, Dee? For all the good it did. <laughs> he was rough. Carry, no problem. <laughs> Carrie'd pass out if I, what'd she call? My dark voice. Hey, what are you doing? I'm trying not to laugh, right? He said, but you've come to Mount Zion, verse 22. This is what you've come to, Christian. 
You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable company of angels, the glorious ones, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Spirits of just men made perfect. You, you know, you could go to Mount Sinai if you wanted to. You'd have to go to three different places, but you could go there. Uh, I've been to one of the, well, two of the supposed places. <clears throat> it's a physical place. It actually existed on the earth, okay? I assume it's still there. I, I say you might have to go to three places, a lot of controversy which one it is. Uh, but anyway... This verse 22, you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You, you can't get in your car and go there. You can't pull out of the driveway and go left or right and figure out how to get there. You're going to go there by faith or you ain't going there at all. And some people think, oh, oh yeah, the faith thing, yeah, uh-huh. Hey, that faith thing is more real than Mount Sinai and all that quaking and shaking that went on there. Faith is always greater. The spirit side of things is always a thousand times greater than the physical. But you have to have eyes to see it, Jesus said. And you have to have ears that can hear. We are made for this. This word of God right here and us like hand in glove, man. Don't ever forget that. This is not some sidebar. Like, we're here going through all this stuff down here, trying to just, you know, exist, get through life. And some people just go to church on Sunday, like that's some, you know, extracurricular activity somewhere over there. Now, that's what some people have made it. That is not what it is and never was. Everything we're going to unpackage and what we unpackage from Scripture is thousands of years old. I've told you this before. If I go overseas and I'm in a foreign country, I'm weird because I'm a foreigner and I'm talking like the weather Vietnamese or the Burmese or somebody like that. And sometimes if I see new people, I have to start out by making it clear. Hi, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm from the States. Uh huh. But this here book is not from America. It's not from the United States. This book I got right here that we're going to be talking about is not from the United States. This book is ancient. In fact, America didn't even exist when this book was written. This here book, I say, is from the Middle East. It's from the Middle East. It, it's not Western religion, in other words, because a lot of times these Asians might think this is a Western religion. Christianity, these people think that. Christianity is a Western religion. It came from the Middle East. They rejected it. And uh, the, the early church took it around the Mediterranean into Europe, and the Europeans, basically, as we know, did it, they accepted it. And then the pilgrims or whatever, they brought it over here. Okay, I mean, you know, you know that stuff. But really, it's not even from the Middle East. It says it's from heaven. It came down from heaven. The word of God is from heaven. It's not, they, these men were inspired, the Bible says. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The Holy Spirit ain't Western or Eastern or anything else. It's divine. Anyway, that's a different study. Spirits of just men made perfect. Is there such a thing as a just man? If you went back to the Genesis account, when God created the earth and in six days rested on the seventh, and every day when he created, he said, good, next day, good, 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 on, you know, the last day. You read that in the Genesis account. But then I jump right to Genesis 6, like that's not too far into the Bible, right? Genesis 6, that's not too far. I mean, I can't, you know, if you're only listening to this message on tape, you can't see what I'm doing. But I got Genesis 1 and a pinch between my finger and my thumb and Genesis 6. Hey, look at this, man. That's not too much. And what does it say? Verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And God was sorry he did it. He said, Noah, build me an ark. I'm wiping this place out. Say, what? What happened to good, good, good? 
What happened to God's plan, man? And now he's going to drown everybody. Verse 9, that's just down below from right where we just read in verse 5. Verse 9, well, 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was what? A just man. Now, that doesn't mean he was just a man. He was a just man. Equitable, fair, righteous. Perfect in his generation, it says. Noah walked with God. What I want you to see, man was not made wicked. Now, there's some that teach that, the total depravity of man, that man is just rotten to the core. Some are. We weren't made dogs. In fact, dogs wouldn't even qualify for that because dogs have no knowledge of good and evil. (laughs) Easy. So dogs ain't wicked. They just dogs. In chapter 5, if you just turn back a page, uh, it says Enoch, verse 23, lived to be 365. Verse 24 said Enoch walked with God. And And then he was not because God took him. Enoch is one of the very few in the Bible. Elijah is another one that never saw physical death. God took him. So Noah walks with God. He's a just man. Enoch, he walks with God. Nice. <clears throat> you see uh, Abraham. We see God saying about David, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. You see, these just men, we just read it in Hebrews 12, were not perfect. But we're going to be made perfect. But they had to bring something to the relationship. We have free will. Well, turn to Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, we see God saying here, see, verse 15, Deuteronomy 30, 15, verse 15. See, I've set before you today life, good, death, evil, And that I command you today, love the Lord your God to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live. That means like live, you know, blessed lives. Multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turn away so that you do not hear and you're drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. Moses said, I announce to you today, you're going to surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in to possess. And I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today that I have set before you life and death and blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. We, a couple of weeks ago, whenever we were looking at some of those things, we looked into, you know, like in Second Peter 2, we look in Jude 6. What did it say? It said angels sinned against God, and he cast them right out of there. They're reserved, it said, in everlasting chains of darkness, waiting the judgment of the great day. Jesus said the lake of fire was made for Satan and his angels and any rebellious human beings. You see, I said before, you know, when you read your scripture, you find out that no human being ever had to perish. God provided sacrifice for human beings right out of the gate. Angels never had that opportunity because they stood in the very presence of God. We didn't. We come in this world with, we're clueless. Innocent as children, the Bible says, until you come of age to the knowledge of good and evil. He drew the line for Israel 20 years old on that too, by the way. 20 years old, where he held them accountable for having knowledge of good and evil. 19 and below, not. New Testament discusses the maturity people need to have, and it's not for 8-year-olds or 6-year-olds or 13-year-olds. Notice this. It says in 1 John 3, verse 12, Not as Cain, 
who was the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works, Cain's works, were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do you realize we're talking Cain and Abel? You're talking back as far back as you can go. Their parents was Adam and Eve, right? You ain't going back much further than that. Well, what was the judgment there that we see in Genesis 4? Well, they came to offer a sacrifice. Whatever gave them the idea that they had to offer a sacrifice? Obviously, God gave them that information. And what did it say? Abel did the right thing, and he offered the first of his flock a, a, a blood sacrifice, which God accepted, but Cain shows up with stuff from the garden. I'm sure it was nice. Man, look at the size of them tomatoes, man. But that was not the point. He offered a sacrifice to God that God did not want. That's not what was required, but he was trying to offer a substitute. Because why? I'm sure he thought he had a better idea. <clears throat> and God rejected it, didn't he? And then it says, it says, Cain's countenance fell. Bible talk for bummed out. He was bummed out. And God said to Cain, what's your problem? If you do the right thing, you'd be accepted too. But when you don't, sin lies at the door. It's desires for you. But you must master it. Mm -hmm. So he meets his brother out in the field and kills him. <laughs> Made him look bad. I don't think that's what God had in mind. Cain, it said, was of the wicked one, but Abel was righteous. Man was not made wicked. Don't misunderstand. Our natural inclination is toward the flesh. You know, we're not talking like a 50-50. I know God said, I said before you, good, evil, life, death, now choose life. Like, that's just a simple, you know, yes or no, uh, chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream, uh, red truck, blue truck. No. It's not as simple as that. It's not exactly a 50-50 proposition here. Man, the flesh is heavy, man. The darkness is great. The light has to be unpackaged. But just like the apostles had a loyalty to Christ, even though they didn't understand some of the things he said, but that's not everybody. Man's inclination is to the flesh. And that's why the Bible tells us in John, or sorry, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what I want to be talking about, these just men made perfect, does not mean they were sinless. They had problems. They had problems. But some people are just bad to the bone, man. You know what I mean? They're dangerous. Remember what Jesus said about some people? I'll just give you this real quick in John 3. Jesus said... Verse 18, he who believes in him, in Christ, is not condemned, but he who don't believe is what? Condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed but he who comes to the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen they've been done in God <clears throat> some people don't want nothing to do they, they love the darkness they are just dangerous people maybe I'll give you this too while I'm thinking about it I'm just turning in the Sermon on the Mount to Matthew chapter 6 remember what Jesus said <clears throat> verse 22 the lamp of the body is the eye if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if the eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that's in you is darkness, woo, he said, how great is that darkness. So you come up to somebody and you look eye, and you look in there, and some people, man, it's just dark. And if their eye is dark, oh, how great is that darkness. The spirits of just men made perfect. <clears throat> you know, I'll give you this too. You know what Jesus said about, if you're going to follow him, see, you have to get, deny yourself, take up your cross, he said, and follow him. And he says in John 12, I'll give you this. Uh, 
Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I don't know about you, I can only speak for myself, but I'll tell you what, when I was in that darkness, and I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing. You know what the Bible says? There's a way that seems right to a man, but then there are the ways of death. That's Proverbs 14 and 12. There's a way that seems right. I did what just seemed to make, I didn't know what else to do. I just followed my dumb friends. And probably most of you did too. The Bible says when there's no king in Israel, people just do what's right in their own eyes. Well, that'll, that'll do you. And that's what people are doing. There's no Lord in their life. And there's no king in their life. So what are they doing? What seems right in their own eyes? And where's that lead? Right into the darkness. <clears throat> that's why it says, I was taking you there, Romans 3 and 23, Actually, if I backed up to verse 10, it says it's written. That means in the Old Testament. Right there in Romans 3 and 10, it's out of the Psalms. There's none righteous. No, not one. None who understand. None who seek for God. They've all turned aside, all together become unprofitable. There's none who do good. No. Nope. Not one. Their throat is like an open tomb. With their tongues they use practice deceit. The poison of asps is under their tongue. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. Again, some people are really dangerous. But if you hate being like that, there's hope for you. You see, I didn't know any better. I knew one thing. I wasn't happy. Getting drunk every day, every day, every day for years and years and years and years. I mean every day. I had it bad, man. Smoking the dope. I didn't mean no harm. You know what I'm saying? Actually, I was a nice drunk. You know, I wasn't a mean one. <clears throat> But I was hurting. That's no life. There's no quality of life in that. And there's a lot of people, yeah, they don't get drunk, but they're empty too. Easy. They're empty. You see, this is all by design because, see, people, when, when, when we're separated from God and our sin, when that, when that time comes, Paul actually referred to it in his own life. It happened to him. He said, I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, he said, sin revived and I died. Well, he's writing, so he didn't obviously drop dead. What death was he talking about that he died in Romans 7 and verse 9? The death of Adam and Eve. The separation that occurred, God said, the day you do, the day you partake of that tree that I told you don't, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will open, you're going to die. <clears throat> And that's what happened. The death is separation. There's an emptiness in a human being when that happens. And the only way you can be made whole, remember the old Humpty Dumpty man, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put old Humpty Dumpty back together when he had a great fall off the wall. We can't put ourselves back together. We can't heal ourselves. We can't save ourselves. It's all part of the plan. It's all part of the design. We have an emptiness. The Bible says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the unrighteous man forsake his ways. See, cast his stuff off. <clears throat> and the wicked man, his thoughts, he said, The Lord will abundantly pardon. It's all by, the, it's all by design. And I didn't realize it at the time when I started asking, seeking, knocking. I was looking. I didn't go to church. I was looking for God, I mean, out in the fields. I walked right past churches. Why didn't I go into churches if I was looking for God? Because I was drinking with church people. What the heck do they know? Spinati told me he used to go to the Catholic church, and on Saturdays they'd have a keg down the in the basement at the Catholic church with the priest. Well, I don't need that. That was my problem. 
So why would I go to church? People I knew at work, a lot of them went to church. Man, they, I, there was some girl, this one girl that worked, the, my, her cube was across from mine. She always wore a crucifix, you know, cross sticking out. Man, F-bombs flying out of her mouth on a regular basis. Why would I go to church if that's what church people do? I, I was doing that all by myself. I didn't have to go to church to do that. Start reading the Bible, though. That's where you're going to find God. Jesus said, you come to me, you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, you find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You come to me. I read that verse and I thought, whoo, I'm on to something here. I didn't understand all that. But that began the journey. God set before a good and evil life and death. He tells us to choose life. <clears throat> But because we don't know what we're doing, and when we're yet without strength, Romans 5 said, see, uh, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Romans chapter 6 tells us, in the wages of sin, that's Romans 6 and 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All you got to do, want it, <clears throat> even though you made a lot of mistakes. Even though you made a lot of mistakes, when I look over here and I'm looking in Luke 18, Luke chapter 18, Jesus, tell, it's Jesus telling the story or giving us a, the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, verse 10. He says, one was a Pharisee. One, you know, he's decked out to the nines, man, this religious guy, the max. The other was just a scumbag tax collector. The Pharisee stood patting himself on the back saying, God, I am thankful to you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here. And <clears throat> I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, could not even so much as approach or raise his eyes to heaven, beat on his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than that other guy. That other guy was exalting himself. <clears throat> he felt fine. He didn't know, as Jesus would say, don't even know. Some people don't even know how poor, miserable, blind and naked they are. Religious to the nines. They missed the whole point. But this publican, Jesus said, went, God said, I can work with him. I can work with that guy. Yeah, but Lord, that's a tax collector. I can work with him. The very next chapter is about Zacchaeus. And guess what? He's a tax collector too. <clears throat> said he was short and rich. That means he's a good tax collector. I mean, good at what he's doing, ripping people off. Easy. There's a reason why the Jews hated the tax collectors, because they were Jewish too, but they were working for the Romans. And he was obviously good at getting the money. So Jesus is passing through Jericho in chapter 19 there. Zacchaeus, you know, he's a tax collector, he's rich. He wanted to see Jesus, but he couldn't. Why? He was short. He couldn't see over, so he had to climb a tree. So he climbs the sycamore tree. And then when Jesus was going by, you know, Zacchaeus could see him, but Jesus looks up and sees him in that tree and says, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I, got, I must stay at your house. So, man, he comes bouncing out of that tree, man, made haste, came down, received him, Jesus joyfully. But when others saw it, they, they complain, they go, he going in to be a guest with a man, the guy's a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, Look, half of my goods I'm giving to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and nobody liked him. Man, he wanted to see Jesus. He was going to climb a tree. <laughs> Zac Jesus comes, Zacchaeus, come on down. I got to have some lunch at your house today. 
Man, he is as happy as can be, man, having the Lord in his house. See, he, there was a good guy in the, down deep inside, you know what I mean? What did he know what he was, you know, like a lot of us? We do what's right in our own eyes at times. There's a way that seems right to us. We've done that. And then what ends up happening to us, according to Ephesians chapter 2? We get so messed up, Paul would say to the Christians in Ephesus, well, you know, where is the raw material for the church come from? The world. The darkness. That's where they come from. You, Christians, he's talking at Ephesus. You, he made you alive. You was dead. In your trespasses and sins, that happens. You come accountable age. You go right from the innocence of your youth right into the darkness. And you aren't even really aware that happens. You start to feel it later in life. You're not fulfilled. Something's wrong. You know, you're not happy. You try this. You try that. You say, I know what I need. A new job, man. You know, I need some more money, honey. I got to have me some more money. Then I'd be happy, you know. I need a new spouse. <laughs> then I'd be happy. I know what I need to do. I need to move to Arizona. That, that, that'd do it. Chasing your tail. Your emptiness is not in those things. It is in. That emptiness is, you, God has separated you, and your soul feels it. You are walking, he said, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were quite naturally the children of wrath, just as other, but God... And his rich mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we was dead in our trespasses, he's made us alive together with Christ, and by grace we have been saved. He's raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared before him that we should walk in them. In Philippians uh, 2, he puts it this way. <clears throat> Verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in just my presence only, but now much more my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. I like how he describes us here. I'm going to Isaiah 66, I think, here. Isaiah 66. Let me see if I'm in the right spot here. Uh, <clears throat> 64, sorry. Verse 8. But now, O Lord... You are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And all we are, the work of your hand. God is the potter, we're the clay. We, we come, man, we don't look like much. I mean, gee whiz, a lump of clay? What does that look like? You put it in the hands of a skillful potter and watch what can be done. We're like a lump of coal, man. But yet under great pressure, we become a diamond. And you know, the Bible is what tells us in 1 Peter 1 and also in 1 Peter 4. Peter said, the trials are necessary to test the genuineness of the faith. And then Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and 12, those fiery trials which are to try you, don't think some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, he said. It's a perfection. It's supposed to be like that. So don't let them hands start hanging down and the feeble knees start to give out. You haven't resisted unto bloodshed striving against sin. He said, get up. Get up. And if God has given you a whooping, you probably deserved it. Get up. Don't despise that. He's doing that because he loves you. He can take these spirits of these they were just men, that, and obviously you wouldn't be here today if you weren't one of those basically at the core. You had some good in you. As, many, as bad off as many of us were, he could work with us. 
And we've come to the spirits of just men perfected in him. Don't think for one minute that just because you come into this is where you got to like just change yourself. No, that's the whole point. You read the verses. We are his workmanship. He is the potter. We are the clay. All you have to do is be willing. Willing. Seek his face. Grow in your understanding and your most holy faith. You want to be made whole? That's all you got. Remember, I like that in John 5, that paralyzed guy's laying at the edge of the pool. Jesus comes walking up, looks at this paralyzed man, and he said, son, do you want to be made whole? That seems like a stupid question, you know. He's laying there all paralyzed, and Jesus said, you want to be made well? No, I like it here, Lord. Uh, if you don't mind, get out of the sun, please. And could you get me a tea? Uh, bring it if you seems like a dumb question to a guy that's been laying there for 38 years it says do you want to be made whole that's all you just got to want it you come to him Jesus said now if you're going to come you got to deny self you got to leave you know, we, you know deny yourself take up the I want it out of that old life I hated my life in this world that's how I could save my life. I hated my life. Most people that I talk to are not happy campers. They feel depressed and trodden down. The problem is most people in church feel that way. What the heck is wrong? They don't have the whole picture. Churches aren't preaching it many times. It's in the Bible. The information is here. I've talked to people. They don't know. They go to church. They have no idea what's in the Bible. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, that seems like a lot of information. You don't have to read it all in one setting. It's like your daily bread. You eat it every day. A little bit, every day, line upon line, precept upon precept. And he'll make those changes. You come to him, you've got to be born again. No, don't forget that. You, you, Jesus said, you must, because you've got to have the spirit to strengthen your inner man, to put to death the deeds of the body. You can't do that on your own. You can't do that on your own. It takes divine intervention. That's what being born again is all about. But once that happens, well, then you go from milk of the word to meat of the word and the transformation and renewing of the mind. And he produces that Christ-like character in your life. He is the potter, we're the clay. We are his workmanship. He does the heavy lifting. Let him keep your hands off his part. You'll never lift it. But don't sit there doing nothing, thinking God's going to make everything just come up roses, because that ain't not going to happen either. <clears throat> so... Let's be encouraged, realizing that life here is tough. But when we find meaning in our suffering, it ceases to be suffering. And that's what God does. He opens a bigger picture. He strengthens our inner man, our spirit, uh, through his spirit. And he gives us the information we need for the kind of faith that moves the mountains right out of the way. So God bless you and have a good week. <clears throat>